I am so happy to have this type of program, this discussion today, because it's Mental Health Month, of which I had no idea. This is Gigi, the storyteller, also known as Emil Ovase. And I must say, it's been a long time coming. And some people would ask, why talk about mental health when society wants to keep it tucked away and the medical profession freely gives away shots and pills to keep people living in mental illness in their type of control. Each shot or pill given is more money in the big pharma pockets. Today, we have three people who will be discussing mental health, depression, and suicide. We have Mikhail, my favorite engineer, known him for years. And then we also have Trisha, who is the founder of Spoken Word Sunday, my favorite venue. We are definitely waiting for her to get back on that track. Clap, 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 yes. <laughs> Last but not least, Corey with an E. <laughs> yeah. Corey with an E. He got me on that. So we're going to get right to it. Uh, we're actually broadcasting live on IG and uh, Instagram and another little camera just to talk about mental health. So Mikhail in the red, bright beret, gorgeous red. Tell us about your history and bring us up to what brought you here sitting in this wonderful discussion.
Agreed. And that's spot on. I mean, everything that they said is what mental health is. It's, it's an aspect of your health that needs to get addressed that really starts with how you're thinking and how you're processing information. So I guess we want to just start with the practicality of just common things that people have experienced in mental health. And I know you guys seem like everyone mentioned depression mm -hmm. that's involved here today. Um, do you guys want to talk about maybe what that looked like for you or what that felt like and, you know, what your, I guess, status is with even getting a grip on it now? For me, it started really young. Um, I think it, it was the core reason for it was when my, I didn't have a father in my life. Um, and I would see other peers with their father and then, um, so that bothered me a lot. And then uh, dealing with my blackness, um, I was, growing up I was really into rock music or things that were kind of white. <laughs> so I would get made fun of. And so that put me in a deep depression to um, try to always hide or change who I was to be accepted by my peers. So that created a depression because I constantly had to be other than myself. So the battle for your identity or to even express who you felt like you could be mm -hmm. because it was your environment wasn't supportive and made you sad. Like, sad. Like, yeah. I think depression, just keeping it real fundamental for people so that they can follow along. Um, it's just a sadness yeah. that allows you to behave within that sadness, you know, differently. I'm going to interject. Okay. Not just that, because sad, being sad is a natural part of life. Like right. when you uh, suffer a loss, the death of a loved one, or whatever, you want to be sad, that's natural. <coughs> but <clears throat> I know this young lady, <clears throat> she suffers from depression for years. And she's another reason why I had this segment. She's supposed to be a part of it, but she contacted me. She's like, Gigi, I can't do it. Uh, the, the, and she speaks on it openly, so I can too. You know? mm -hmm. So I have to re-understand or overstand depression. It's not just about I'm sad. It's different. It's more than that. It's like... Uh, a person with fibromyalgia, which a lot of people don't understand that either, but when you have that, you it's depression because you're in pain all the time. So then you can leave self-pity, you know, because I'm an active person and then I can't do some things and then you get depressed because you're unable to do the things that you want to. I was just reading on that. A lot of people say, oh, depression is sad, but we are going to look that up. It's like a, it's a twist I think, on it. I think the sadness is like the peak of the iceberg. I think that's how you know that that's what you're dealing with. That sadness, like you said, things happen in life that, yeah, that's your normal reaction. And we should be sad if you lose someone that you love. But it's just your inability to create the chemicals needed to bounce back and get back to your equal. And maybe, you know, some intensity that's behind it where it looks like, wow, you're more than just sad. That's when we can start labeling things depression. But clinically, uh, you have to be in that state for two weeks or more mm -hmm. to even have that qualifier. Other than that, um, it's like a cycle. Things are up and down. Just like when we look at the money, you know, Wall Street, you know, companies lose money every day and then they bounce back the next day. A lot of that is just modeled after how we are as humans. Um, a lot of this data that's collected, the way computers process, that's really like our minds. So... Uh, to be connected, you know, to one another, I think that's like operating under the system of like a circuit. And so when things short circuit, like you said, you had a, a hole in the family circuit. You know, it was like a, a visible gap that you could identify because the father provides a lot of energy, you know, and that energy is transferred to you to create those endorphins. Right. And if you don't have it, then you have to find other ways to be stimulated to process. So I can understand how the depression you know, seeps in because think about it, like you have to you have to have a, like some type of father influence. That's why single mothers from our era pride themselves on saying I was your mom and your dad. Because mm -hmm. you got part of it, yeah. but it just it was a substitute. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why we can be balanced and healthy now. So where would you say you're like how would you say you're handling the void of like a father now? Like do you have a relationship with your father now at all? Yeah, anything? I mean it's still kind of quirky, but my goal was to not be angry for his absence, mm -hmm. um, and then just try and find a reason why he was absent, which I did, we talked about it when I was an adult, so I spent my whole life being upset with him, not understanding that he had mental health issues going on, and he felt like his absence was better than him being involved, because he wasn't always there, and he felt like my mom was going to create a better environment, but it's like, so I went through all of these years feeling some type of way, or like I wasn't enough, or my sisters weren't enough. Because then I can even having um, 
like if it's there, it's there, and we can only hope to compensate. Mm -hmm. But if we don't actually recognize it in real time, of course, in hindsight, twenty twenty, you know, as they say, vision is twenty twenty in hindsight. And when you look back, of course, you can recognize like because for me, I had issues with having an absent mother, and just when you when you're a male, your relationship with your mom is really like an indicator on how you're going to treat women going forward. So if you don't have that type of like practice then going forward, everything is kind of like foreign, and it's like, well, I don't really know exactly how I want to engage, you know, what is appropriate, what were boundaries, and I think that's what the relationships with our parents really did was define a lot of boundaries for us, so I don't know where y'all want to go with this, but. I did want to say one thing, that uh, <clears throat> a lot of people who suffer from depression do not know that. Like, recognize that they're depressed. You know, <clears throat> one great person at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that we come in contact with, we meet them when we're out and about uh, doing our craft, when we're on the mic. I've, in the past year-ish, uh, I have this book I'm gonna show you because I have to I write it down stuff because, woo, you know, it's to be out there, you know, but I'll bring it in and I wrote, find a spoken word poetry. You know what I mean? And then um, I found Spoken Word Sunday, and I'm not going to cry. You have no idea the wonderful release that I was able to experience when I go there. It's just a wonderful family. And you guys, your mom, um, you know, your husband, I mean, just open up your arms for me, and you guys have no idea. And I've heard a couple other people, they said that Spoken Word Sunday saved them. You know, just to go out and be around that type of environment with you. It starts with you because you're such a loving person and you just spread it all around. You don't have any, um, you know, favoritism. You may, but if you do, you don't show it. So it's like, it's like a church. You know, when you go to church, you feel safe, you know, for people that go to church. You know? my, my experience is there. I thought that's what it was. Like, it felt like. Okay, this is a church group that does like poetry after church or something. Everybody like always thinks that, but uh, no, I'm not even Christian. <laughs> That's what's crazy though, is that black people doing positive stuff, it always got to be connected to a church. Because I remember just doing community work. We were on Rosecrans and Long Beach Boulevard passing out water to people. It was in the summer. They were like, oh, I don't want to buy no water. I'm like, it's free. They were like, well, what church is this? It's not church. Yeah. <laughs> That's the same with me when we go to Skid Row for my birthday every year. So you, I have like a small birthday party on Skid Row, so we'll have like cake, <laughs> I know, cake, ice cream, and like giveaway. We didn't know this year because my baby was too little. But they automatically assumed it was church, and I think it was because back in the day, unfortunately not currently, but back in the day, the church was, was refuge for a lot of people. And I think now it has such a bad look. But before, it got real political. Got, yeah, it got really political. But before, especially when I was growing up, um, when I was in the church, before I converted, it was, it was, I looked forward to Sundays, you know, right. and then it became a chore, you know, like, I don't want to go, I don't know how I feel anymore. Yeah, you and know? that's, that is interesting because that is a, like a mental thing, like mm -hmm. your perception and the way that you see it. At first, if it's like under my own free will, I'm going to enjoy it. But if you're like making this an obligation, I don't enjoy it anymore. But it's the exact same activity, same people, same everything. It's just the way we perceive it. It's different. Yeah, and I think that you that's... You know how many ministers I used to minister to because Our emotions, that's why. talk to the pastor talk to a deacon or talk to the mother of the church right but mm -hmm. now everybody's really about money 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 you know yeah, there's no emotion involved in money that's why all of that clouds the relationships you know as soon as you bring money into the mix people just get uncomfortable mm -hmm. i don't know i don't get that and a lot of them folks uh, because this is the ghetto truth magazine the truth or a truth I have a lot of experience with after Christianity. That's my background. And, well, I got stories to tell you, but a lot of people who are Christian who just follow that regime, they so depressed. They have so many mental illnesses that they are unaware of, and they believe that if they just keep at it, you know, doing this, and then they'll get better, they'll get healed. But that's not the case. So. What do we do and how do we do it? To start here with discussions that we're having right now, you know, this is being recorded and other people listening 
will see that regular people. Oh my God, Miss Gigi. Yes, Miss Gigi too. I think, I, um, and I'll cut you off. Go ahead. But I think the first thing that needs to be taught is that uh, that it's all right. It's mm. okay. That uh, if you're going through some things, you need to talk about it. You know, especially in the urban communities, it is looked down upon to ask for help, especially being a man.
accept it. There was no, you know, compassion or understanding what I was going through. The first thought was, black people don't do that. Right. And it's like, it's so many black people that have killed themselves. So many black people that have I left home about or thought yeah. about it. And they can't voice it to get the help because either the church people going to say, you need prayer. Or your mom and dad are going to, you know, shut, shut you out because they don't want you thinking, you know, right. that you have an issue when you do have an issue. And it's just like, you know, like you said, like a, a, something you need help with. And if you don't get the help, like if your car is messed up and you go to the mechanic and he says, you know, your brakes are messed up or you got this issue and then you keep driving, you keep driving. And then it, the problem is worse. And that's how mental health is. It'll just keep getting worse and worse until you get the help for it. So we need to make it a norm for it to be okay in our community to seek help, get the help, and help your situation. Right. And in my practice, I like to tell people that they shouldn't put uh, band-aids on injuries that require bandages. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times our trauma, we treat it like it's a band-aid. And one of the things that I've seen people deal with and you know, that will cause them to want to be suicidal, uh, just a lot of sexual abuse and rape. Survivors of rape are the people that really feel hopeless with reconnecting. And I've noticed that the connection and the, the lack of connection, because I've had men come in uh, suicidal because of heartbreak, the woman of their dreams and their, their wife left them. And, you know, even talking about why they were left and what it did for them, it always boiled back down to, I lost my family. She took the kids. Like, I'm disconnected. And so in that isolation, I think that that's also what fuels depression. And as a people, we need to get back to being more family and community oriented so that we can have more natural supports to deal with some of these things that we're all experiencing because you would, you know, a lot of people have went through just community trauma. Like something simple as like having a gun pulled out on them. That's something that needs to be discussed more often so that people can overcome some of their fears because as black men in these communities, we, especially urban areas, we just have so much irrational fear in relation to one another because of a past experience that may have happened five, 10 years ago. But we know the reality of that experience can happen and to me, the best way to get, get past that is just connecting with community. Suicidal <clears throat> is highly emotional. And when you're dealing with um, a relationship that's over, that's the worst thing ever. And I have to put this out here. Um, you know, that was me uh, several years ago. There was a relationship that I was in and um, before I met you, Mikhail, and they wanted to like break up with me, and I was just crying because I just love this person. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it was one year, and it was what it was, and basically they didn't like me being social because I was performing real good back then. You know, I was up on stage and whatever, and they didn't like that. And so they wanted to tear me down. And, and break up with me to see how that would react. I'm like, if I was, I don't know what actually saved me knowing that I really didn't want to do that. But I remember just in the room, living in Linwood, just crying. Can you imagine? I want to kill myself over somebody else who, you know, they wanted to be with me, but they were trying to play games with me. They were trying to control me to get me just to, you know, just be with them and not my, my friends, you know. They told me I can't even uh, breathe the same air as your friends. I'm like, okay, you gotta go, so. I could believe it because I've sat in session with people and they were embarrassed to even say that that's what caused them to attempt suicide, is that they were, you know, left by their lover. And women have come in under that pretense, but more often I've seen more men that were willing to just throw it all away because the love of their life moved on. And I think it's more, my personal opinion, <laughs> I think it's more men than women because of the stigma placed upon you, brother. <laughs> so much stigma uh, placed upon you guys just to be this strong man, you can't cry, you can't do nothing. But right. So as soon as something serious silence. happens, it's like the dam is broke and then everything starts flooding. Right. And what I learned was um, when you do break up with someone, same emotion or trigger to a relationship breakup as wanting somebody to die. Mm. It's, it's, the, it's the exact same like chemicals and what nerve endings and things yeah. like that. And uh, just uh, learned that uh, like a couple of weeks ago and, and it makes sense. So like the same way you would feel somebody die is the same way you would feel like breaking up. So it's like you gotta, you gotta 
respect that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that just comes with being honest with ourselves because it should be that type of loss. You know, like if you value the relationship mm-hmm. because it's dead at the end of the day. So that makes perfect sense. So just being real with ourselves and some of the things that we experience, uh, I think it's up to us to have a standard to say that wasn't right. You know, like somebody did me wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I even went so far to just tell people, you know when people flake on like their little movie dates or I'm gonna pull up and we're gonna kick it for people because I'm a mental health like ambassador and I'm a professional, but I tell them like, yo man, you betrayed me. Like I feel betrayed. You told me you was gonna be here at a certain yeah. time. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's yeah, so it's extreme. Yeah, it is, but you know, it's, it's about the emotions that are attached to that because that's what it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Trisha, how did you become an in counseling? Um, so I had issues with depression for sure. Um, like I said, I always have to find my identity, and after a while, I would just fight. You know, I was like, all right, you want me to be black, and this is what it feels like. <laughs> we squat, you know, and then I'll go home and listen to my rock music. So it was like, you know, <laughs> um, and so once I understood how I felt after doing the counseling sessions and being able to talk about what I was going through. And then once I got older, I always pushed counseling. And it's still in our community. It's like, no, we ain't doing that. It's still, I still did that backlash. Right. Even now with going to school for psychology, it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? That's what people don't understand how important it is. Um, so that's how I got involved in it. And then three years ago, I lost uh, my cousin to suicide. And he had a big mental health issue. Um, he was actually in a mental ward for a while. And he was brought home and he was on medication, but he didn't want to take it because he didn't want to accept his problem. But he yeah, was literally was hearing yourself voices and I would when I would go to his house I would hear him in the room talking to these different people or using different voices in this room. It would sound like there were multiple people in the room. But it was him. It was him. And so he yeah. ended up shooting himself in the backyard while my aunt was asleep. She was watching him but he she fell asleep. And so it's like he had a mental issue. And mm-hmm. we as a family, we as a community, uh, our family church, we have to understand that we have to fix the issue. We can't just pray on it. Faith without work is dead. Nothing mm-hmm. you can do without putting the work in. So that's what really got me involved is seeing what could have been prevented. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we don't get that person back. And too many times we see the extreme case when it's too late. Mm-hmm. Like people don't see the extreme like when it's untreated for ten years. We don't see that, you know, because that person that we come across as maybe in year one or two of their depression, we don't want nothing to do with them anyway. You know, we're just trying to avoid that. <laughs> A lot of people, like what I was saying earlier, they look at it as, as being weak, and then what, what they don't understand is like, and I, I spoke on this on my IG. See, that depression starts getting comfortable. Mm-hmm. It starts, it starts feeling good. You know what I mean? And um, you know, I try to. You think depression is like, a crutch for some people? Sometimes, but then there's sometimes like for me in my situation. You know, it, it started comforting me. You know what I mean? It, it, it really did. And, and I just told somebody just a couple days ago, I was so close to doing it with a little voice in my head. I was talking to my brother, my brother June, like two days ago. And I said, the only reason I didn't do it because a little voice in my head said, you do this, you ain't going to like where you're going. Mm-hmm. It, it, and it kept on telling me, it kept on beating. Okay, yeah, you can do this, but you ain't going to... You ain't gonna like the results of it, and I, I don't even know where what would that, but it was it was just that 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 close, you know. And, um, and I'm glad I didn't do it, you know. I'm cool, you know. But the thing is, people have to understand those that are going through depression. It's not a crutch for them. You know what I mean? People aren't uh, looking for pity parties or, or anything like that. It's something that really affects your body. Right. You know what I mean? And it it, it, it immobilizes you in some instances. And that, that's what has to be, I guess, articulated more as well, is that our mental state is directly connected to our physical state. You know, like, you can, you can experience something physically and not be expected to recover, but if you have the strong enough will and the strong enough mind to, you know, put yourself into a rehabilitative state and you rest and you regenerate enough cells, you can overcome a lot of doctor predictions, especially when it comes to, like, healing, just internally. Mm -hmm. There's a young person that I know 
bullying, hurting subject and all of this. I feel helpless. You know, I want to reach out to him, but I know I can't do anything for him because in, you know, when everything that we do, it starts with... It's you know, called paranoia. At the end of the day, that's what paranoid thinking is. It's projecting your thoughts onto other people and expecting them to behave in that manner because you are afraid of them. So uh, it gets back to the knowledge of self and just knowing your identity and knowing what works for you um, and really just being honest about what those insecurities may be. So I've had clients, you know, assume that when they were walking down the street, people thought that they smelled bad. And so in that session, the way that I had them correct that and work on some of that anxiety was to do like a self-examination. Like, did you take a shower? Did you use deodorant? Well, why would they think you smell bad? Do you actually smell bad? And when they answer all those questions and they start to look at themselves more objectively, then they can just be honest, like, you know what, you're right, maybe I don't. And, you know, it's just, it's all about reducing the pressure. Because a lot of times our thinking, once it becomes rapid and pressurized. And, and overthinking. Yeah, and, and overgeneralized mm. and exaggerated for the worst. Mm -hmm. I guess you can call it, really attribute that to just your mental health and your perceptions of things. And once you can do what is called reality testing and test, you know, your thoughts versus what's really going on. Then you on can, the daily. On, on the daily. That's the, tr that's the key is to be able to do that very regularly so that you can continue to reinforce what's real. Uh, a movie that I would recommend for people to see uh, that really illustrates that is Inception. It's Leonardo DiCaprio film. And they talk about how you can create your reality in your dreams. And then when you wake up, a lot of it is just a manifestation of that. So. Mm, dreamscape. Exactly. That's a 90s movie that has got me through the years because at my uh, time in life right now, I see that you can create what you want to happen mm -hmm. for your life. You know, if you're constantly on the drudge, go back to the scriptures, whatever you focus your mind on, you know what I mean? That's what you get. So, people who are watching um, this episode of Mental Health, Depression, and Suicide, and um, we want to listen to you all as well. Later on, when you come back and you see the episode on um, YouTube and Facebook and, and all these social media networking, do know, everyone that you see here or you hear my voice, we've been there where you have been many times and uh, me with my age of 59 it can get scary because you feel alone you feel like no one else is in the same boat as you but as you keep going you start meeting people and then you start learning more about yourself and that's I believe that's the first step to learn about yourself then you know how to um, start working more with bandages instead of a band-aid you know, so, um, so I'll make sure that we get tagged so that if anyone out there wants to reach out to us individually with questions or any type of follow up, I'm sure that yeah, we'll yeah, all be yeah, open to that. That's not a problem. Yeah, so I don't have anything else further to contribute. I just, I'm thankful for y'all's attention. I'm glad this topic is now getting uh, some steam so that it can be more of like a, a table topic for people just, you know, at dinner and during casual conversations. That's we just have to get it more out there because yeah. that secret, it's secret, you know, especially in our community, like Trisha mentioned, because from the south, it's shh, you know, <laughs> you don't talk about it, you know. I have family members getting help. Um, we don't want any secrets because we don't want to hear another story of a suicide at all. You know, do know that extreme, um, Mikhail always put it out there, the suicide hotline. They're there always. There's always somebody that wants to listen. And um, you got to understand, you're not alone. You know what I mean? And, and there's so many people that's going through it. And they get the help. And then it gets better, you know? And I say, get past that second, 
you know, with everything that's going on in your life and at that moment and you think however you want to take yourself out, give yourself another second. It's like when you're driving and you want to go through that yellow light, you know what? With your own self, with your own mental illness, slow down on that yellow light. Go on. Because <laughs> guess what? It's all right. Slow down before you go through that light and you're causing all kinds of accidents because you didn't take that one second. Take that one second and just think about yourself. Think about the people that you will leave behind because I did have a, a young friend of mine and I'm writing um, something on suicide. He just straight up told me he did suicide. And I told him, I would never forgive you in this life and another life. You know, how selfish are you? And that's my own personal opinion. I know people who suffer from depression and they want to uh, just end it all because it's so overwhelming. And what I tell people when I counsel them, of course, there's a lot going on in the world, but don't, like the scriptures say, you know, some good stuff in that book. Don't take on tomorrow and bring it on today because there's already enough on your plate. You feel me? Don't put it on there. Break it down. Oh, you got this, 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 this. It's overwhelming. That can make anybody just shh. <laughs> you know, just deal with each one, you know, one at a time and work your way up and just keep climbing and building yourself strong, you know, and, and, and live past that one second. That's what we want to end right now. That message, live past that one second. Call someone. Go on Instagram. There's people there you have seen the wisdom. I mean, nobody is going to bat you away, for real. Because there's a lot of people who want to listen and just listen to what's going on. Because if I'm talking to you, you're not killing yourself, right? Right. That's mm -hmm. it. So, Mikael, Trisha, and Corey would I want to thank you <laughs> for coming to this wonderful, intimate discussion on mental health, depression, and suicide. I think we're going to have another one because I'm going to add some more people in and I'm going to get that Infinite Waters guy. Uh, yeah, I said I was going to mention him, and that will be the last note. He says that depression, and I invite everyone to go to um, YouTube, Infinite Waters. And he says that depression is, a, is simply, he threw that in there like that, simply a deep rest. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Peace, love, and light, we always say. Cool. Cool. Yeah,